Mood differs from aspect and tense in that it expresses a speaker's perspective toward what they are saying. The term mood is often used to refer to both grammatical mood and modality, two similar yet subtly different ideas. Grammatical mood is the grammatical expression of various modalities. Modality is the meaning conveyed by those grammatical expressions. For now, let's focus on modality. Human languages feature many, 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 many different flavors of modality. Starting on the left branch, Propositional modalities are concerned with the reliability of a speaker's statements. Languages usually deal with propositional modality in one of two ways, epistemically or evidentially. Epistemic modality, from the Greek for knowledge, deals with the judgments speakers make based on what they know or believe. Compare Malcolm may be at home now, Malcolm must be at home now, Malcolm will be at home now. Malcolm may be at home now is an example of speculative modality. From the speaker's point of view, Malcolm may or may not be at home. They are unsure, speculating. Ergo, speculative modality is frequently used to express uncertainty. Malcolm must be at home now is an example of deductive modality. Deductive modality implies inference from observable evidence and, at least in English, signals that the speaker is confident in their conclusions. Maybe the lights are on in Malcolm's house and his car is parked outside. Ergo, the speaker deduces that the most reasonable, if not the only possible conclusion, is that Malcolm is indeed at home. And finally, Malcolm will be at home now is an example of assumptive modality, which deals with inference from what is generally known. Maybe it's the weekend and it's generally known that Malcolm doesn't work weekends, so it would be reasonable to assume that he is at home, albeit he could very well be away visiting family or something. Side note, English's will also signals future tense and future habituality and a whole bunch of other stuff. English's future is seriously moody, remember that. Anyways, that essentially is the epistemic speculative, epistemic deductive and epistemic assumptive done. Speculating, deducing and assuming based on what a speaker knows or believes. In contrast, evidential modality deals with the evidence a speaker has to back up their claims. Generally broken into linguistic evidence, reported modality, or observable evidence, sensory modality. In FASU, there's a distinction between whether the speaker's info came from a known source or an unknown source. Similarly, in Central POMO, a speaker can use general knowledge or established fact to support their claims. These are examples of reported to, reported three, and reported gen modality. Secondhand evidence, aka hearsay from a known source, third-hand evidence, aka hearsay from an unknown source, and evidence from folklore, established oral traditions, evidence from general knowledge, that kind of thing. All of these are subtypes of reported modality. On the sensory side, Ngiamba has a marker for sensory evidence, and it's used for all five senses. So it's got this sort of general sensory thing going on. Whereas Tuyuka has one marker for sight and another for all the other senses. That is to say, it features visual modality and non-visual modality. Furthermore, Central Pomo has a dedicated auditory marker. Now, no language has specific markers for senses other than seeing and hearing, but Kashia has a catch-all marker that can be used to signal non-visual, non-auditory evidence. Visual, non-visual and auditory modality are all subtypes of sensory modality. Side note, deductive modality and assumptive modality can be both epistemic or evidential. One can deduce and assume from one's own judgment or from evidence. Anyways, evidential modality, done. Now for the right branch. Event modality is concerned with events that have not taken place but potentially might. Deontic modality, from the Greek for it is needed or necessary, deals with obligations and permissions coming from an external source, like another person for example. On the other hand, dynamic modality deals with ability and willingness coming internally from the speakers themselves. Compare Zoe may slash can go now and Zoe must slash has to go now. The first suggests that Zoe has been given permission to go, although it would be perfectly acceptable if she didn't. Permissive modality. Whereas the second suggests that Zoe is obliged to go, and not going would be a bad call on her part. Obligative modality. And finally, commissive modality indicates a speaker's commitment to do stuff, usually found in promises or threats. Hoban shall have the book tomorrow, Hoban shall do as he's told, or else. Deontic obligative, deontic permissive, and deontic commissive, done. 
Now, ablative modality expresses, well, ability, and volative modality deals with willingness. Inara can run fast. Inara will let you stay. In the first statement, Inara has not been given permission to run fast. Rather, she has the ability to do so. Ablative modality. The second could be referring to Inara's willingness to let people stay in her house. Volative modality. Simple. Dynamic ablative and dynamic volative. Done. And modality tree done. Oh yeah, the extras. Consider the role may plays in a sentence like Jane may be rich, but he's not happy. May here is not speculative, it's being used to presuppose Jane's riches. As in, hey, we both know Jane is loaded, right? Well, it turns out, he's not happy. That is to say, this use of may in this context indicates presuppose modality. As mentioned earlier, the future is the moodiest of the tenses. Will and shall both express future time alongside various other modalities. Even languages with inflected future tenses often employ modality to signal future time. Like for example, French or Italian. In some languages, negative statements and questions, interrogative statements, carry the same modality. In Imbavora Quechua, the critic chu is used for both. Now, Mandarin has this badass feature that lets the speaker negate both the modal verb and or the main verb of a statement depending on what the speaker wants to say. In other words, I can't go, I'm capable of not going, and I'm not capable of not going. Which is awesome, because like in most other languages, like English, if you negate the modal verb, you negate the whole statement. Kaylee can go, Kaylee can't go. Commands like come in and don't worry about it are known as imperatives. Cheyenne has two kinds of imperatives, commands that are to be carried out immediately and those to be carried out later. It also has a separate jussive form. Jussives are like imperatives, just aimed at first and third persons. Conditional modality deals with if this, then that type statements. If you heat the water to 100 degrees, it will boil. If Simon wins, people will cheer. If River won the lottery, she would go on holidays. The first is an implicative conditional. Basically, if this holds, then so does that. The second is a predictive conditional. If this were to happen, then that would also happen. And the last one is a counterfactual conditional, where a situation is dependent on a false or unlikely condition. English uses a whole bunch of words to convey nuanced conditional meanings. Other languages, like Caddo, use conditional moods. Purpose of modality marks, well, purpose, like in Spanish here. As in, the purpose behind me lending the money is so that he can buy a ticket. Australian languages love themselves some purpose of modality. For the most part, it's used for obligations, of all things, like in this example from Nyamba. However, Nyamba also uses it to express indirect commands. Now, warning, this next example is a bit intense. Apologies, it's all I could find. Gerbil uses the purpose of in main clauses to suggest a result from an unknown cause. In Yedin, it can be used to express purpose and to indicate a natural result. Now, why obligations, indirect commands and results should be marked as purposive is a little mind-bending at first, but think about it like this. There is a purpose in me doing this thing, obligation. There is a purpose in you doing this thing, indirect commands. There is a purpose in this thing happening. Result. Oh, and speaking of results, resultative modality specifically deals with results, like in the Latin here. A good analogy to demonstrate the differences between purposive modality and resultative modality is to be found in the English statements, Shepherd worked hard so that he became rich, Shepherd worked hard so that he should become rich. In the first statement, the result is riches, whereas in the second, the purpose for the hard work is the riches, but we don't know if Shepard ever actually achieved that result. Result emphasized, purpose emphasized. Desirative and timative modality expresses wishes, desires, fears, etc. Here's an example of desirative modality in Fula, and here's an example of timative modality in Latin. Interestingly, the communication of fears in Classical Greek is so moody that we can ditch the verb of fearing altogether, and the meaning of the statement doesn't change. The fearing part is totally implied, it's pretty sweet. And finally, some languages treat habitual actions in the past as modal. 
like how in English one might say, we would go for a walk most weekends. Pretty straightforward, but it gets a little weird. In the next video, I'm going to cover realis and irrealis moods, but for now, when I say realis, think real, factual, etc. And when I say irrealis, think unreal, non-factual, and so on. Got it? Okay. In Bargam, the habitual past is treated as unreal, which is really weird given that the past is anything but. Like, the past happened, it's real, it's factual. So why wouldn't you treat it as real, Bargam? Turns out, this statement is both real and unreal. It's an example of hybrid modality. The quote, real part being the fact that the speaker has asserted that the habitual action did in fact occur. The quote, unreal part, is the fact that the statement lacks things like specific temporal references, specific evidence, etc, etc. Bargam, that right there is brilliantly bonkers. Do you know what else is brilliantly bonkers? The length of this video. So it would be best if I finished up here, although I could keep talking about modality. If I were to though, you may get bored. So I shall be on my way. Good morning interweb, happy new year, he says on the last day of January. Sources, Mood and Modality by F.R. Palmer, links in the description, great book. Also, the Advanced Language Construction Kit by Mark Rosenfelder, links in the description too, another great book. Thank you all so much for watching, and a massive thanks goes out to all the wonderful patrons, in particular, Isaac Silver, Andrew Shahail, Robin Hilton, World Anvil, Rip to Passe, and John Huyer. New year, new plug, so I want to give another shout out to World Anvil. If you're the type of world builder who has bits of your world building on paper and in various hard drives and on various docks, and it kind of infuriates you that it's not in a centralized place, go check out World Anvil. It's an online resource where you can store, create, and manage all your world building needs. So far, everyone who has gone over to World Anvil based on these videos has been super happy with it. So yeah, go check it out. Links in the description. Tell them Edgar sent you. And until next time, Edgar out.